Right, week eight, video seven, style two. So we started off this week's video series by talking about style and then we broke off talking about the general stuff in order to talk about functional decomposition which was needed for lab eight and also top-down design. So I'm going back on the topic of style. Now Pylint is enforcing many of the style rules that uh, are in the course and are in the lecture notes. I'm going to for the most part skip over those because you don't have a choice in this course you have to obey those in order to get your code submitted i'm going to focus on those areas where you do have a choice where if you're not careful you can still write rubbish that's pylon compliant so i'm making the distinction here in the lecture notes between the stuff in green which is checked by pylon and i'm not going to talk about that and the stuff in blue where you have a choice and i want you to focus on getting that choice right so talking about whether the code is nice and readable, the key thing to readability really is good identifiers. What do I mean by a good identifier? It's an identifier that captures the meaning of the variable at all times. So uh, x equals 23, what's x? Do I know what x is? If, if this is a computing a function y uh, of x, then maybe in a mathematical sense it makes perfect sense. Inside a program, I don't necessarily know what x is. So I'd like you to name your variables in such a way that I don't have to ask the question, what's x all the time, or what's um, Fred or Charlie or some equally stupid name that you thought you'd put in because it was Pylon compliant. Next important requirement for good readability is that you've broken your code down into functions, that each function has a simple, well-defined role, that the name captures that role and is a very clearly uh, natural sort of functional decomposition. We've covered that at length. Avoiding repetition, I don't want to see the pieces of code repeated uh, in several different places. And uh, when you write a comment, it has to be an explanatory comment, not ASDF, ASDF. And in the last super quiz, we're going to be checking all these things with real humans, not with Pyland. So as far as this course is going, there are three documents that define style rules, if you like. The first one is the very famous PEP8, and I've got it over here. This, you'll see, is written by Guido van Rossum. That's a very famous name in the Python community. He's also known as BDFL, which stands for the Benevolent Dictator for Life, because he's the guy who invented Python, and he is the ultimate authority on everything Python-related. Other people contributed to this document. It's not all entirely Guido, but he gets the credit here. So there's a lot of great insight in this, and I do recommend it to you. A lot of the stuff that's in here is uh, either checked by Pylant or it's um, difficult, obscure stuff that isn't relevant to an introductory programming course. But in between, there's some really, really interesting stuff. An often quoted line is that a foolish consistency is a hobgoblin of little minds, meaning that style rules uh, occasionally need to be broken. But only occasionally, please note. And in COSC 121, if they're enforced by, by Pilot, then sorry, even that doesn't work. But I will give examples during this of, of when I occasionally break style rules, when we all break style rules. So as far as the rest of this video is concerned, the thing I'm focusing on is another document called the COSC 121 Style Guidelines, which are available through the COSC 121 uh, Learn page. So if we go to the home page for the course, there's a link down here called uh, Departmental Python Style Guidelines, and in here it needs to be extended a little bit so you can see it properly. There's a document that has all of the... Uh, detailed rules that I would like you to be using in this course. Now, each one has a little bit of an explanation about what the rule is. There's the rule, globals. Use of global variables should be avoided. Then there's some explanation of it, which I certainly don't have time to go through all that now, and I do encourage you to read it. Uh, and quite often there are a distinction between guidelines and rules. So if it says something like must, be done, then that's a rule. If it says something like should be done, or then it's a, it's a guideline, may be done is really a hint. So there's sort of different levels of rules. So please look through that. I don't have time to do that now. I'm going to pull out a selected subset of these. They're in the lecture notes. And then again, I'm going to skim through looking at just the blue stuff, because the green stuff is mainly pilot enforced. So a note on good identifiers, good variable names or long variable names are appropriate when uh, a variable is being 
referenced over quite a large number of lines. It, it's an important variable because it has what we call wide scope. Scope of a variable is how many uh, of the, or what range of the source code it's meaningful over. So that constants at the top, global constants, are very wide scope, they're seen throughout the code and they should have very clear identifiers. So an identifier should capture the meaning of the variable, that is what's in it. So I shouldn't have to ask you what is this variable or what does this do, the name should tell me. There are some short identifiers, one character one's available to you, which you can use over very short bits of code, like, like within a very small loop. I, J, K for loop variables, C is just any generic character, S is any generic string. Function names, we've already talked about the distinction between functions that return values and functions that uh, are what we call procedures that do stuff like write files, plot graphs, um, print to output. I'm not going to read all that again, we just covered that in a previous video this week. Functions, to repeat again, must be well named, do one thing well. If the name of the function doesn't completely describe what it achieves, not how it does it, but what it achieves, then uh, think again, maybe your function's a bad choice of a function if you can't describe it succinctly in one identifier. We ask you to minimise the use of break and continue and sometimes in fact we set quiz questions and exam questions where you uh, will actually not be allowed to use those just so you don't get too addicted. When I was younger and learning to program I used to think uh, that I'd written some terribly clever code. Oh this is so cool, I'm so clever. Oh. Um, nowadays I realise that if I ever find myself getting excited about how clever my code is it almost certainly isn't clever code at all. And it's worth noting that during tests and exams I often see people writing quite a lot of code that actually there's a method call to do that or a function that does that and if you put a little bit of extra time into learning what the methods of strings and lists, maybe dictionaries coming up, if you know what all the methods are and what the global functions are, you can save an awful lot of time. Make, don't reinvent the wheel all the time. Right, um, avoiding variables in code. I'm going to skip over this because PyLint rather enforces that, so we'll just go over the top of that. PyLint also enforces most of the layout requirements that are in these notes over here, but it doesn't enforce the need to write two or three blank lines between functions. That certainly improves readability. You know you have to have doc strings, please write decent ones. And in fact, as far as the last super quiz goes, which is style assessed by real human beings, not by PyLint, you'll have to include in your doc string at the top of the module, that's a program, the role and the author, who you are and what date you wrote it. And you'll get penalised if you don't do that. You might as well get in the habit of doing it now, it's cheap. Every function must have a doc string saying what it does, otherwise you don't, don't need too many comments. If people spray comments throughout their code, they've probably written bad code. Uh, maybe if they wrote the code properly in the first time, then they wouldn't need that. Things like uh, P equals some computation, followed by a comment that P is the point of intersection. Why not call the variable point of intersection? I didn't need the comment. Um, that I will, well, then I wouldn't need the comment. So, I've, we've said this already, we don't want to see numbers in your code. The only good numbers in your code are naught and 1, arguably 2. Anything else should have a name so that the reader knows what on earth you're talking about. I don't want to see 52, I want to see uh, weeks and year or uh, cards and deck or whatever it is. You already know about the what I'm calling the pilot gotcha in the lecture notes. You can look at them very quickly. It's just telling you that you can't get away with global variables, really. And that's all I wanted to do in this particular video. In this next one I want to talk about an old book from my past, 1974, that is remarkably relevant nowadays and we'll look at what it says and why it's relevant. Thanks for watching. Bye.